NanoHub U online instruction. Welcome back. I'm Professor Rickus. In this lecture, we're going to talk about cellular architecture and the design principles of organelle number. What are the design principles and parameters that determine the number of organelles in a cell? So specifically, we'll talk about dynamic control of organelle number, the cellular mechanisms of organelle production and reduction. We'll look at mitochondria and chloroplasts as example systems, as well as plasmid replication and a, a simple mathematical model looking at control of plasmid replication in bacteria. So if we look at some of the various organelles inside cells, they can vary quite a bit in their number from one, such as a nucleus, to um, one or many, flagella or cilia. A cell can have many mitochondria that are connected quite commonly in one network. And so the question is, how do cells control this number and regulate this number? So the first design principle we're going to look at is dynamic balance. This is a very similar concept to the dynamic assembly that we looked at for regulation of organelle size. And in this dynamic balance, we have a balance between the rate of production and the rate of loss of the number of organelle. So if we look, it's just a simple ODE sort of rate equation of this, where we have dn dt, where n is the number of the organelle, is simply a balance of the rate of production minus the rate of reduction. Quite often there's feedback where one of these rates is controlled or influenced by the number that are present at the given time. So these rates here of production or reduction may be one or both a function of the number of cells. And by that feedback, the cell is able to then control and settle on a characteristic or steady state uh, level of number of organelles. So cells have, depending on the type, different mechanisms of organelle production or reduction. Right, so to increase the number, they could have, could use de novo synthesis. In other words, creating that organelle from scratch by self-assembly of the building blocks that make up that organelle. Or it could occur via division or fission, such as mitochondria, make more mitochondria this way. Similar to the idea of cells making more cells by division. Different mechanisms for decreasing or reducing the number of organelles. We could fuse two organelles into, a, into one, so organelles could fuse into a fewer number. We could also have degradation, either active or passive degradation of those organelles, as well as partitioning into daughter cells during division. So let's look at mitochondria, for example. Mitochondria are an example of this fission-fusion process. So mitochondria do not arise from de novo synthesis, so the assembly of um, simple assembly of raw materials. But they produce by fission and are reduced by fusion. And the cells control this fusion and fission process in response to stress and during the cell cycle. So you can see here's a cartoon showing what happens. Here's in our example of a model system of, of mouse embryonic fiber, fibroblasts from this work here published in Nature Reviews. And you can see this cartoon of what happens, this fission fusion that's going on with the mitochondria during cell cycle. And so fusion occurs in preparation for high energy demands, whereas Fission starts to occur in preparation for division. We need to make more mitochondria as the cell gets bigger and as it divides so that the two daughter cells have the right number of mitochondria at the end. So this, there's a segregation that happens into the daughter cells as the cell divides. And so some, this leads to questions, that are the organelles randomly or precisely distributed during this division? So if I double the number of individual mitochondria that I have in my mother cell, do those mitochondria get distributed equally? Is that a random or is that a controlled process? So this question was asked um, by researchers looking at chloroplast in algae, a very similar fundamental question. When the cell divides, how do organelle numbers get distributed? 
right? So this could be random events, and the outcome would be that two daughter cells would receive organelles in a number based on a binomial distribution. This is like flipping a coin, right? Each chloroplast has a probability of one half of entering one of the daughter cells. So, or on the opposite end of the extreme, this could be very precisely controlled. And the outcome would be that each daughter cell, more, more often than not, receives more or less equal numbers of organelles, more often than you would predict from a random distribution or by this binomial distribution in this coin flipping scenario. And so Hennis and Berkey uh, looked at this question and they counted chloroplasts in mother cells and daughter cells as they were dividing in these algae. And they found that the data, the distribution supported something in between, that the data supported a stochastic event with a tendency towards equal distribution, right? More equal distribution than you would predict from a totally random or stochastic event. So the stochastic feature introduces some variance that can accumulate with cell division numbers, but you don't see evidence of accumulating achloroplastic cells. In other words, you don't see the um, a cell arising that has no chloroplasts. So this suggests that cells can count their organelles, that there's some level of stochastic, but there's some level of control, that the cells are somehow controlling and preventing the emergence of cells without chloroplasts. And so if a daughter gets too few, does it make more? If a daughter gets too many, does it make fewer in the next round of division, or is it regulating uh, segregation? So as we said, this though, the important point here is that it suggests that cells can somehow count organelles. So they're somehow getting feedback knowing the, the number of organelles, in this case chloroplasts, that they have inside their cell. So this leads to a fundamental question. How do cells count their organelles? What is the mechanism of feedback to increase or decrease the number? And what's the feedback control system look like? Can we describe this mathematically and study this like any engineered control system? So some different possible mechanisms for negative feedback. One very simple mechanism is that organelles could produce a diffusible signal. We'll call this signal S. And S is produced at a rate that's dependent on the number of organelles that are there. So if you have more of that organelle that's producing S at some rate, then you get more S produced. And that signal would naturally have some half-life. We'll call that K1 half. So that there's some steady state signal that's per amount of signal that's proportional to the number of organelle. This would be one way that cells could do this. So we would also need as a note here to consider cell volume, which will concentrate or dilute the signal molecules as it's, as the cell is dividing and its volume is changing. So a classic example of this particular mechanism, so this mechanism has been observed biologically, and the classic example is plasmid replication. So in this case, this diffusible signal negative feedback, there's control of plasmid replication in bacteria where there's a gene for some signal that's encoded in the plasmid itself. And the signal is an inhibitor of plasmid replication. So we have negative feed feedback coming back from the number of plasmids that are there. And so researchers have been working on mathematical models of plasmid copy number uh, regulations for several decades. So let's remind ourselves just real quickly what plasmids are. So we said in a couple lectures back that, uh, that DNA in uh, prokaryotic bacteria can occur in genomic or in plasmids. So plasmids are circular double-stranded DNA. They're usually supercoiled in structure, this cartoon of supercoiled uh, plasmid DNA. We often cartoon draw them as a nice circle, indicating this circular connected rather than having free ends but they usually supercoil structurally like this. And they're separate from a cell's chromosomal DNA, um, and they're naturally occurring in bacteria, yeast, and other, um, and some other uh, higher eukaryotic cells. Right? So they have this symbiotic relationship with their host cells. Now you probably know of plasmids more, more um, commonly as a tool in the lab for biotechnology and synthetic biology, and um, and they also naturally have evolved these antibiotic resistance genes, which has helped maintain their presence naturally in cells and provide this symbiotic uh, relationship. That's their advantage 
um, in this case, to the, the host cell. So plasmid replication, plasmids are usually, um, they're about one to a hundred kilobases in size, and they replicate independent of their host DNA. And plasmids are segregated to daughter cells during cell division, much like we've talked about the mitochondria or chloroplasts getting segregated to the daughter cells during division. So the model system, um, specific model system for plasmid regulation by negative feedback is the coli-1 type plasmids in E. coli. Okay, so we have this RNA2 transcription happening. This is our, we have replication primer, right? And here's our origin of replication. And this, our signal, our negative feedback signal here, S, is RNA, is this RNA1. And so what happens is this RNA1, if it binds right here, we get no primer maturation and no DNA replication. If there's no RNA1 around and we get no RNA1 binding at our replication site, then our, we get primer maturation and DNA replication occurs. Right, so this RNA1, our signal is encoded on our plasmid. And therefore, as the more plasmids that are there, the more RNA1 we have. So we can build a simple mathematical model of plasmid replication based on this. So we can build a plasmid rate equation and a soluble signal rate equation to determine how the number of plasmid and the how the amount of this signal, the number of molecules of this signal, RNA1, are changing in time. Okay, so we define the small p as our plasmid concentration, beta as our maximum rate of plasmid replication, right? And that is, this total production rate is going to be related to this maximum rate times the amount of plasmid we have, right? And as well as a probability of replication that is influenced, is a function of how much signal we have. That signal changes the probability of replication being able to happen. Okay, so we have some plasmid dilution rate. So we assume that there's some natural half-life, um, either natural or via cell division occurring um, of our plasmid. And we're gonna assume that that's all happening by cell division as opposed to natural decay. And if we do that then, our alpha is just natural log of two, natural log of two over our doubling time of our cell. So it's the cell division that's causing the dilution of the plasmid inside the cell. We'll define S as our soluble signal concentration, our RNA1 concentration, beta two as our maximum rate of signal production. So remember RNA1 is coded on the plasmid itself. So this is this maximum rate of transcription of that gene to produce our RNA1. And that we have some signal degradation rate, that there's a natural half-life to our signal, right? And we designate this with alpha two. So in, in this function here, this f of s, there's two different models that we can look at. We can look at a hyperbolic regulation model. And so what this is relating to is that replication probability as a function of the amount of S here. Now here we've um, plot this versus S naught. And so we've normalized our signal level here. So we can use either this hyperbolic function model or this exponential regulation model and examine how the two compare to what we see in our natural system. So we've briefly described this model. We're gonna save analysis of this model as a homework problem for you to work out at home. So coming up, we're going to talk about biological, we're gonna move into biological networks and we're gonna start talking about gene circuits and cellular dynamics. I hope to see you then.